So Amir and I are here to talk you through some of the key things you need to consider when carrying out a document review. Um, we're going to start with looking at what information you should be collecting, how you should process that, and then the task of actually reviewing it. As you'll hear throughout today, finding contemporaneous documents that evidence your client's participation in a cartel is quite vital to it, achieving immunity or leniency. And while this is probably the least glamorous part of working on a cartel, it's extremely important um, that you take a lot of care and attention to getting the document review right. So there are various situations where you would consider conducting a document review. Uh, the most obvious perhaps is after a dawn raid. Um, here you'll be under very tight time pressures and you'll be wanting to review not only the documents that the Commission has taken throughout the dawn raid but potentially those that they haven't as well to see what's contained in those and to help with any possible defences and just to assess your exposure. If you've not been the subject of a dawn raid um, but you're considering maybe applying for immunity then you won't be under the same time pressures and you'll have more time to sort of consider what it is you're potentially looking for. And usually this will start with an internal investigation and you may have interviewed employees and from those interviews they will help guide what your document review will be and your document collection. Another time where you may undertake a document review is perhaps if you've received a RFI from the Commission. So in order to answer that RFI you may need to go searching for some documents. But before actually just launching straight in, there's a bit of information and planning you need to think about. Firstly, you need to consider what jurisdiction you're looking at. Is this going to be a local issue or is this a global, potential global cartel? And if it's global, who, which office perhaps will be in charge of running the document review? What exactly are you looking to investigate? So what products are involved? What projects are of interest? Then you might want to think about what functions within the organisation that you're most interested in. And usually it's going to be the sales and marketing teams. And then once you identify those roles, actually narrowing down to who the particular individuals are within the organisation that you are of, most, of, are of most interest to you. And these will be your custodians going forward. So the data that you usually want to capture is that that's contained on laptops, PCs, servers, backup tapes, for example. Um, and if you think that there's a risk that data may have been deleted, um, then you may have to consider getting that data restored. I think it's, um, it's important to mention at this point as well is once you've identified who your custodians will be and where you'll be collecting that information from, it's important to, to consider the fact that there's been new technology introduced of late. So you've got Blackberries, you've got personal phones now, they're all smartphones and people um, would have their personal emails as well as sometimes professional emails on there. So it's important to consider that when collecting the data as well as things such as hard copy uh, files that might need to be collected. Uh, it could be the case that the hard copy files that are collected will not be reviewed in, in hard copy. They might need to go on to um, review tools, uh, which we'll, we'll discuss later on. Uh, so collecting hard copy files, uh, checking perhaps um, IM messages or Bloomberg chats, which you might get as well in some cases. Some of the common problems that you may come across is where an employee is left, so someone who is of interest to you but they're no longer at the company. So you need to try and investigate whether they've actually left any of their documents behind or perhaps you still have a good relationship with them and can maybe bring them in to interview. Not always going to be the case though. Um, incomplete backup tapes may mean that you end up having missing data which is not going to be good, uh, and corrupted servers as well may require specialist IT guys to come in and fix that. Okay, so you know the rough scope of the data that you're looking for and who within the organisation is of interest to you, but before you get started you need to think about data protection, unfortunately. <laughs> Um, because as you can imagine, just like your, if someone came in and said they're going to copy your computer, there's not only work stuff on there, there is inevitably going to be personal information contained on there as well. Um, data protection isn't easy. I run entire sort of lunch sessions just on data protection. It's quite complicated, but for the purposes of today, it's just important to note that 
there are different laws within each jurisdiction. So you will need to get some legal advice from each of our colleagues in the relevant jurisdictions. Um, if there's a basis in law, then it will be easier to get around data protection. But if you think about it, if you're an immunity applicant, for example, I mean, becoming an immunity applicant is not a requirement of law, it's just a, something that you're voluntarily doing. So it just makes things a little bit more difficult. So you really do need to um, have close contact with our TMT colleagues to make sure that you're not breaching any data protection laws or to the extent that you have to sort of breach one or the other, there are ways to try and minimise any of the data protection breaches. Um, it sometimes depends on your client and how sensitive they are to breaching local laws, I guess. Um, some may just see huge potential fines from a, car a competition perspective and not care too much about data protection but others may not take that view. So it's just about balancing what your client wants and what the laws are and trying to get the best result for them in that respect. In an ideal world, you'd get consent from everybody, but unless you're dealing with upper management, consent can actually be really difficult because it's deemed to not be given freely in many jurisdictions. If you're a low level employee and your boss comes in and says, well, I need to image your computer, you don't really have a great deal of choice because there's the threat of potentially being fired. So while consent is the ideal, it's not as simple as that. So I just want to reiterate, it's a very complicated area and it is important to get TMT involved as soon as possible. In the stage we're looking at between um, pre-collection and actual data imaging and collection, a few uh, technical aspects that are important to consider. Obviously, mm -hmm. after considering the, the time frame that we have, and identifying who the custodians are um, and how many of them there are. The volume and the complexity of data is very important, uh, whether it's a case of collecting all the data uh, in, in an example of, say, a dawn raid, or if we actually know exactly what we're, what we're after, any particular um, date parameters that we have. So the complexity of data and where it will be collected from is very important to consider. And that will also help us um, help guide us into uh, the client experience in collection of data. Are they familiar with the process of collecting data? Have they done similar exercises before, or is this completely new to them? Uh, if it is the case that it's completely new to them, or they're not familiar with it, it might be advisable to have um, sort of forensic teams uh, to to go in and to assist them with collecting the data. But that's something that we have to do with the um, IT managers there. Um, another thing to consider as well uh, with regards to the forensic collection, uh, as I mentioned, if we have a, a dawn rate situation, for example, we would consider this idea of cost. Um, a LIHO model is basically means low in, high out. So we have lots of data that we're collecting. We're not quite sure what's there. We're not quite sure who the people are. So we go and collect all the data. Then we would apply filters later on and the higher cost would come out of the data that we're going to look at or that will be processed within the tools that we're using. A basic or flat rate model would be applied um, with, with the providers of these tools if we know exactly who the people are, the date ranges that we're looking at and so on. So we know that more or less the, what's going to be going in will be the relevant information. We just need to maybe cut down a little bit or filter it, apply search terms and that kind of thing. Okay, so now we're actually ready to start to collect our data. There are a few things you need to think about. Um, the usual starting place is to engage a forensic IT consultant to take a, an actual forensic image or a, a point in time image of the data contained or that the custodians have. Um, there's no point actually just taking certain folders that you think might be relevant. Um, because as you can imagine, if you're trying to find those hidden gems, it's not likely that there's going to be a nice little folder that says naughty stuff. You know, you, so you need to take a, a full image of the entire PC and then review that later. It's also important to get the local IT staff on board as well, because they're the ones that know the IT system. So it's good to have them working hand in hand with the forensic IT guys. There's this issue of um, custodians being present. I'm not sure how often that happens, but I would imagine that once they're aware that the process is happening, then provided they have been informed of that, I doubt very much that they would actually sit there and, and sit through the whole copying process because it can be quite laborious. But um, I think provided that they've been fully informed, they usually say, yep, here's my laptop, off you go, and then it gets given back to them at the end of the day. 
Um, just coming back to a few points on data protection, it actually may be necessary to disconnect computers from the wider server. Um, this is particularly in relation to Germany. Um, and for server information, you can imagine if we're only interested in the sales team and you take a full picture of the entire server, then you're going to capture you know, secretaries and people in manufacturing and other areas as well. So it becomes an issue of proportionality. Um, and that may be deemed sort of disproportionate from a data, prote perspective, data protection perspective. So again, I mean, data protection does fit in in quite a few areas here and things that you need to, to think about. Um, Overall, any of these sort of big data collection um, processes require a lot of coordination between external providers and internal providers and it's really important that you provide clear instructions on the roles and responsibilities of each of the individuals just to make sure that no one's stepping over the other's feet and that each of the tasks has been delegated accordingly. Does anyone have any questions before we? Sarah, how often do you have clients that can say, we'll just give you our, we'll, there's no need for these consultants and things like that, we'll just give you the emails to tell us what you want? I haven't had any personal experience of that or anyone else in the room. I mean, my... Can you repeat the question? Oh, apologies. Like, how often do clients just say, here you go and hand over the information without us then needing to require external consultants to come in and do it? Um, my example is sort of the opposite, where it's an extremely large company spread across seven different jurisdictions, um, a lot of individuals involved. I just think the sheer scope of it was not something that they could possibly consider doing. And I think it's quite, um, it's not as simple as just saying, here's the hard drive. I think, you know, there's a bit of techy <coughs> stuff involved in actually getting something from a server or from someone's PC to then put it into a format where we can review it. So I think there's, I mean, you, you we, we, We've had examples actually where people have done that. They've, they've come up to us and they said, well, we'll collect everything, we'll just give it to you. And we said, well, there's actually more to it. You need to preserve the metadata, you need to maintain all the data and all the information contained within data so that when you put it onto a processing tool, uh, it can read all that information. It can pick up things like um, blind carbon copies on, on emails and that kind of thing. So. Um, it is important. We've had clients before who have bought sort of off-the-shelf, off, um, yeah, off-the-shelf products to use collect the data. Very, very dangerous, and we've completely advised against that. So we have had that happen to us a few times. So it's important to um, to refer to LSC, perhaps, or um, someone who might be familiar with it, to advise the client accordingly. And I wonder sometimes too if that would satisfy maybe requirements we have in the U.S. If it's a global cartel, maybe there's proceedings in the U.S. I don't think the courts would be happy saying, oh, well, the client just gave us what was relevant. I think we have to show that we've taken a complete forensic image of everything, and to do that, I think you need the experts. Right, so now we've got our forensic IT team on board. Um, what we need to do is have the data processed. So what usually happens is the raw data is collected and then uploaded into a litigation review platform. So you want to make the information that goes into that platform as easy to review and um, identify the key documents as possible. Um, so what some of the things you need to consider then prior to the raw data being put into your review platform are things like deduplication. So what this means is um, if I send an email to three people, then there's technically going to be three copies of that email within the server. So we're each going to have a copy. So we can either choose to ensure there's just one copy of that email within the server, or we just make sure that me, I don't have that email three times within my set of custodian documents. And I think that all comes down to how important it is for you to know who has what documents. If that's not so important, if it's just the fact that the document's there once, then that might be fine. But if you're worried that maybe an employee has um, destroyed documents, things like that, um, and they should have this email, but they don't, then that might mean that you would want to deduplicate um, across the custodians. Uh, the other things, oh, yep. Just a question, can you dedupe uh, email chains so that you actually only keep the most recent one and you don't have to read you know, the whole chain? 
That's the email thread? Is yes, that, yeah, uh, yeah we we're going to... jump to that. No, yeah. no, no, we'll jump to that now. We'll do it. Um, <laughs> yeah, the, the email thread analysis, which you can see um, is on the slide, basically, it, it does a similar thing. It wouldn't remove the, the emails. You'd still have instances of the emails. But what it can do is it can find the latest email in a whole discussion thread, let's say. And then um, you could then have a look at the whole thing, uh, review it, decide how you're going to code it, and then you can tag everything else... And yeah, whether it's sort of relevant or irrelevant, it will do that. So it can identify which is the latest one, but it wouldn't remove it. It wouldn't remove sort of following on emails. So it would automatically code yes. those other parts that yeah. went there separately then. Exactly. Yeah. So it, when you might come to it when you review, but it will already be coded, so you can just skip over it, depending on how you reviewed the first one. Mm -hmm. So just a follow up on that then. I wonder, because email threads can be tricky because you get several people, so mm -hmm. I reply to you, you reply to me, that, that, mm -hmm. you know, we, we go off our tracks, and then I'm actually saying, look, it's brought to Mr. X. We can't really do that, so let's bump up this price, please. Mm -hmm. How would you have a safety net to protect? Would you just simply identify these are two different threads, or you would, because the system of coding, mm -hmm. since I've been going through similar systems, mm -hmm. SAR, actually, mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm familiar with the tools, how would you, you know, catch that to avoid that? I mean, these tools are, are very accurate in terms of what they pick up. Uh, they will pick up things like sometimes you would have a part where you can see one particular email, who it's gone to, who it's been, who's been copied on it, who then replied to that email to another person or forwarded to another person. And it will lay all that out for you so you can see it exactly where that email has gone and all the different, um, different people it's gone to and so on. The other thing it does is that... It, it doesn't, um, these review tools tend to look at emails not within their, not in the context of their uh, content, but the metadata. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very accurate. Um, we've had one example recently where um, I was talking about this idea of deduplication. And uh, two members of the legal team said, well, we've had two documents here that are identical, two emails that are identical. Uh, why, why were they not deduped? And we found out that actually it's because it discovered the metadata had one person who was BCC'd into an email, so it treated it differently. So they do pick up on the metadata very, very accurately, and so that helps you basically have a very accurate reflection of, of the emails, what's been forwarded, what's been replied to, and so on. Does that answer the question? Okay, so the other thing to think about before the data gets put into the document review platform is... Um, what file formats you're going to use. So the co most common ones obviously are email, PDFs, Word, um, but there are some sort of new ones cropping up. Yes, I mean, it's in terms of uh, deciding what, what you'll be looking at, it's very important to decide what information we have, uh, what email, uh, what file types we have, because some tools will support certain file types, others wouldn't. Uh, a small example is with emails. Uh, you can have Outlook items, you can have Lotus Notes. Some tools will not su support Lotus Notes, for example, so um, very important to, to decide or to at least try and find out what file types we have. Um, in terms of things like videos and voice recordings as well, if that's something that's going to be relevant and we'll need to be looking at, it's important to pick the right tools that will have um, functionality to support this. And we've had examples as well of uh, people who wanted to conduct reviews with .cad files which are sort of architecture-related files. Um, most tools wouldn't support that. So uh, quite complex, and it's important to um, highlight from the start what type of file types we're going to be looking at so that we can choose the right tool. Just due to time, I'm going to skip through this slide. It's pretty self-explanatory um, and move on to something that's a little bit more useful, hopefully, and that's trying to design effective search terms. So. We're going to have our list of custodians. We know who we're interested in. And from that, maybe from interviews and things or RFIs, whatever information we have, we can come up with some keywords that we want to focus on. These may be in relation to particular products or project names. And usually there will be a date range that we can apply as well. Um, it's really important, something maybe you don't always think about, but if you have custodians who speak a particular language, particularly in a global cartel, there's no point running a search term in English if they're all Spanish. And that sort of happened to us and we didn't find out for a while and we're like, why are we not getting any of these hot dogs? And it's because 
they'd only searched in English. So it's a simple little point, but important to remember. Um, Layering is really good to refine your search. So for example, we've got this example here. You receive an information request for all relevant business documents, sorry, for all relevant documents relating to a meeting of 31 December 2010 at the Hotel Conrad Brussels between James Bond and Felix Leiter regarding Project X. So there's lots of kind of keywords that jump out at you there, but if you just put all of those into the search thing and said, find me everything with that, you potentially not going to have a very good result. You're going to have either heaps and heaps of documents that just aren't relevant um, or nothing that if you're just trying to find one document that has all of those things in it. So it's important to maybe start with the date range. Maybe do a day or two before the, the date of interest and then of all those documents then add another search term. So you might want to add then the Hotel Conrad and then within that you might want to break it down even further. So just trying to layer it a bit more so you're searching within a search and things like, you know, James Bond might be Mr. Bond or Mr. B or, you know, so there's various ways you can actually import some of those keywords. Um, so it's really important that you come up with a good way of defining those search terms. Um, and Amir is going to run through some tools that can actually help us do that. <laughs> so um, layering and, and providing all these different key terms and uh, date parameters and so on is one way of filtering down your searches. But um, with the technological developments that we've had lately, the search tools that we use and the, and the review tools that we use have got a few um, clever bits of functionality that, that uh, will help you with your review. Um, concept searching, for example, uh, what that does is it's very keyword focused. It will look at all the keywords that you're applying. It would look for all the emails. And then it would look for a concept. And it would relate it to a concept. So the example that you have on the screen there is um, we use the word diamond and it's found um, earnings which wasn't uh, which was relevant investments but it also found football and what they found in this case was that um, some people were using football terms to describe um, something that was relevant and so it actually helped in building the the search terms that were going to be used uh, so that it helped the the legal team then put together some extra keywords to try and identify uh, some documents that could be relevant. So concept searching is one way of helping you uh, at the outset in terms of just identifying keywords. Uh, things that you can use later on is clustering, which basically groups um, documents by themes. So it looks for like documents. There's also find similar features. Well, it, you can um, decide uh, the similarity percentage. So I want to find a document that's similar to this. 80% similar, 70% similar, whatever it is. So um, these are two ways of doing it. Um, other types of examples that we can use, uh, where we had something like James Bond, J Bond, uh, we've got STEM searching facility in some of the tools, which would look for different variations of a word. So as you can see the example here, we've got direct, it will find directions, directing, directional, it'll give you a whole list of words that it's found within the emails, and then you can tick to decide which ones you think would be relevant to what you want and which ones aren't so relevant. You'll pick up things like words that might have a hyphen um, or plurals, that kind of thing. So very useful. And lastly, predictive coding. It's a new technology that's being introduced, and um, we're kind of uh, erring with a side of caution here with this one because you basically teach the tool how to code. So it would give you, for example, a set of 5% of the documents. You would, uh, you'd have the reviewer look at all these documents, um, tag them and code them accordingly, and then it would put it back into the system. The system would run certain analysis, and then would give you back another set. And you keep doing that until the, the system is confident enough to basically um, say that it's picked up enough information for what you've given it, so that it can code everything. Um, we don't think it's, um, it's the best tool to use right now. I think we're still testing it out to see how relevant, uh, how useful it's going to be. Don't get too excited that you know yeah. that you have to do document review. Um, <laughs> we would say it's useful maybe in terms of uh, prioritizing searches. So if, uh, if you decide that these documents have been identified as what would be coded as relevant, maybe look at these first or maybe have um, first level reviewers, paralegals, look at the documents that may not be so relevant so that you can just prioritize your searches. So there's basically lots of things to help you come up with those good search terms. Yeah, and this is just a table um, 
just to give you an example of some of the um, litigation review tools that we use, uh, Clearwell is an outsourced tool, so is Documatrix. As you can see, most of them do everything in terms of your basic keyword searching, date range searching, and so on. Um, some of them would have functionality such as stemmed searching. Uh, load file ingestion is quite important as well. It's limited at, at the moment within Clearwell because of this idea of Outlook items or Lotus Notes. It would not take in Lotus Notes, for example. So um, important to come to LSC and speak to them about their experience, which might be the most useful tool or the most relevant for this exercise. Xilab, just to mention, uh, some of you might have used it in the offices in Brussels, Paris, and Germany. Uh, that's an in-house tool, but it doesn't have a review platform. So what it will do is it will do your keyword searching, date range searching, and so on, but you wouldn't be able to actually code anything within Xilab. Okay, so your review platform's looking great. You've got all your documents in there with your search term. Now it's time to put the review team together. Um, there's, there's two ways, I guess, of doing it. One way that, um, that we would uh, perhaps suggest is if you have um, Linklater's LSC, the Legal Services Centre, um, who I'm part of, uh, if you have us liaise with the client's IT managers, referring to external review platforms because we're quite familiar with them, we can help advise which one's the most uh, suitable platform to use and we can help speak to the IT manager with the clients to get the right data. We can then put a paralegal team together, at least for your first level review. Um, it's a low cost resource and very quick to hire and what we can do is, as well is apply specialist skills um, for example, foreign languages. We've had a review recently. Um, we had 40 paralegals brought in for that review uh, with all sorts of language skills. Uh, very useful. We had 10 of them who were French speakers. Um, and we had other languages on the team as well. We had Russian, Arabic, um, German, Portuguese, lots of languages. So sometimes very useful if you need quick resource to find so that they can assist. Um, we can also have relevant backgrounds. Often you'll get people with particular technological background or um, construction, that kind of thing. You, you can get that as well with some paralegals. Another thing to do is maybe outsource a, a, the whole operation or a big part of it. So in the matter that I was working on, we had done many months of review internally, but then we realised the volume of documents and the time pressures that we were under, it didn't make sense for us to continue the review. So we had PwC come in with a team of 20 within sort of four or five days and they conducted the full first level review of the documents that were left. So that was a huge help for us and which meant that we could then just focus on the second level review. So that's also an option. Is the common practice to outsource the, some of the operations to other lawyers outside the firm? But because like, it's the common practice for instance in the United States for investigations with large volume of documents, they use contract attorneys. Yeah. I know they definitely do it in the US and I'm working on a matter now within London, it's run out of London, but it's the US side are doing the document review part of it and they're using contract yeah. attorneys, so it is possible, okay. but I don't know that we do it so much here in okay. Europe. Now, paralegals are contract based, so yeah. we tend to flex our paralegal numbers based on our demand, uh, but we don't use other law firms to do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we can see that the so every review should have a review manager. Um, that will be sort of the li liaison point between uh, the reviewers, LSC, external providers and the client. Um, and it will basically be their job to keep on top of everything, particularly when it comes to feedback to the client and keeping ahead of all the costs involved because they're quite expensive exercises. Um, and then the review structure, usually there's a few levels of review. The first level will be done by the more junior lawyers who are sort of weeding out the really irrelevant documents and trying to highlight some of the more useful documents. Then an uh, associate group will probably be in charge of the second level review. They'll have a bit more background about the matter and they'll be able to really find those key hot documents which will then go to the partners and it will be up to them then to decide whether or not these particular documents will get submitted to the commission. Um, uh, yeah, I think just to add to the idea of the review structure, obviously it's quite important to decide that because it will help you in uh, applying the relevant coding as well. Whether you want the coding to be as simple as something like relevant and irrelevant on first level and then for second level, same thing, relevant, irrelevant. And then if you get relevant on second level, that would then go to the third level. Or it could be something a bit more um, complex. So 
you can have different categories within first level and then the, the legal team, the associate team on second level would then look at certain categories as priorities and then anything that they would highlight as a hot doc would then go instantly to a third level review which is obviously very important in terms of race for leniency in, um, in these types of cases. So important to consider review, your review structure and your coding forms for each of these levels to help you speed up the process as much as possible. Yeah, um, what I mean, we've we've had one for example that uh, recently that referred to different jurisdictions that we've had. So uh, we said this documents are manifestly irrelevant, uh, so these can be discounted um, completely. And then we've had documents that would be for different jurisdictions, uh, and then we've had hot docs. So these were done by the first level reviewers. Uh, the second level reviewers then went and looked at the hot docs as their first priority, and they decided whether that's relevant or not. Um, some things I can think of too are maybe in terms of products. So if you've got various products, you might have it via product. Um, it could be via theories of harm, if you know what your theories of harm are. Um, Jurisdiction is another one. Um, there will also be a privileged category, no doubt. If we're lawyers reviewing this, there'll no doubt be privileged. Um, so there's just a couple more examples. And we've, so on one review, we've tiered, tiered our hot dogs. So hot dogs are the most is the red category, but you've got documents of interest that are relevant to the investigation, for example, that reviewers should grab as background, etc. You might have inculpatory documents, damaging documents, or exculpatory documents, documents that are positive for the case. So I think it's really important, because you're going to have fleets of reviewers taking the instructions and going and tagging, that actually there's some careful thought given at the beginning, and I'm sure Amir and others in the group will have precedence you can use, but how you code documents is really crucial. Yeah. Yeah. And ultimately as well, once you get to your hot docs, you can even have a tag as hot docs to produce, and that will be very easy then to just go into the system, get everything under that folder, and, and that's it, the system will group it all together and, and that will be ready to disclose. So very useful to, to apply in the first instance and to think carefully about your coding forms and, and, and your tagging. Okay, last slide. Um, once you've got your review team together, I can't stress enough how important communication is. Um, it's not a glamorous job, as I mentioned at the beginning, but it's really important that everybody on board has clear instructions as to what it is they're doing. And these will evolve. As the matter evolves, as we learn more from the documents, these instructions will evolve, so it's important that there's a group of people in charge of updating all those key documents for the reviewers. Um, if there are particular documents of interest, you may kind of identify them. We might call them curveballs, where you don't wait till the end of the day or the end of the full review. You actually, these are particular docu documents that you will raise straight away with the partner, and particularly if you're in the race for immunity, these, these might be of use to have straight away. Um, but you would just agree what those type of documents are. Um, quality checking is extremely important. Um, whether that's just a sample or whether you have sort of a quality checking team that just goes through and reviews each reviewers just to make sure that they're on track. And the important thing about that is not to sort of say to people, oh, you're crap, you're not doing this right, but it's to basically give them the feedback as soon as possible so that then they can understand, okay, this is how I should be doing it from now on. So it's not a, a negative thing, but it's just to make sure everyone's on track and coding in the right way. Um, is usually going to be the review manager that's in charge of updating the client and they'll usually have regular intervals when they do that. And I think that's really important also for keeping the review on track. If you do have those deadlines each week with the client, then it kind of motivates the review team to, to continue pushing so that we meet those deadlines. So I guess just to wrap up, um, appreciate there's a lot to consider there, lots of things <laughs> to think about. Um, especially in terms of collection, um, pre-collection and, and the review itself. Um, but don't fear, help is at hand. Uh, feel free to, to get in touch with us uh, as early as possible. Mm -hmm. So myself, um, project leader in the LSC team, or my supervisor, Jazz Monday, uh, you can find us on People Picker. And um, we'll, we'll help you in terms of picking out the right technology, the right tools to use for, um, for the, the review that you're undertaking uh, to ensure that this is as speedy and 
painless and cost efficient as possible. Any quick questions? Thank you.